Two women will be going about their household tasks. One will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. You've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there. She hears a noise and turns her head. We'd all been ready Two men walking up a hill One disappears and one's left standing still I wish we'd all been ready There's no time to change your mind The sun has come G3857, we only see it the three times, and all three times it's translated out as paradise. A very, very interesting word indeed. Now, we get some scriptures that in the Old Testament, and it doesn't look as though it's going to load, but it's pertaining to, so Ezekiel 28 and 31, it's pertaining to, there we go, it's pertaining to the to the Garden of Eden, right? The Garden of God. Now, Ezekiel 31 are some very, very interesting scriptures indeed that allow us to make some very fascinating connections in those scriptures. So verse 2 tells us that we're, we're talking about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? And then it starts talking about the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. So this whole chapter is about Pharaoh and his multitude. And in fact, that's how it ends up. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. So the whole chapter is talking about Pharaoh and his multitude. But from verse 3 on, all we're reading about is the Assyrian being a cedar in Lebanon. Now, when I read Ezekiel 31, I see all sorts of connections to, to the king of Tyre, to Lucifer, to that big tree that Nebuchadnezzar was being likened to in, in Daniel 4 and 5. I see all of these connections, and we're reading about Pharaoh and his multitude manifesting as this Assyrian who was a cedar, who was a cedar in Lebanon, right? So Pharaoh, king of Egypt, in Ezekiel 29, is being described as the great dragon, right? As the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers. Now that word dragon is Hebrew word H85, Double seven, the great dragon. And in Ezekiel 32, the scripture, the chapter after 
Ezekiel 31, the scripture I'm talking about, we're reading that Pharaoh is art as a whale. So he's being described as a whale here. And in, and in chapter 29, he's being described as the great dragon. So Pharaoh is being described as a great dragon and as a whale. And it's the same Hebrew word, right? It's the same Hebrew word. So we come into the Hebrew word and we see it the 28 times. Hebrew word H8577 is translated out as dragon, serpent, whale, and sea monster. And the first time we see it is in Genesis 1.21 and God created great whales. So we come back down into Ezekiel and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is being described as a great dragon and as a whale that's in the seas. So I, I, I read this and it really captures my attention because in Revelation, we read that Satan, the devil, is the dragon, is the dragon, right? So here we're reading that the, the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, He's being described as the great dragon, right? As the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the of his rivers, and he's also being described as a whale in the seas. So he's being described as a as a sea monster, right? He's being described as a sea monster. So I'm being led to think that we're talking about a celestial sea monster. We come back to Ezekiel 31, and that's what we're talking about. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? And then we start reading about the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. And where I'm going here is that how we get Eden and Lebanon in the one verse as it seems to correlate to the same thing. So we're talking about the Garden of Eden, right? And remembering that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and he tempted. He tempted the woman. So I'm being led to think that the serpent was in the Garden of Eden, and we know that the anointed cherub that covereth. He was also in Eden, and here... We're hearing Pharaoh, king of Egypt, he's being described as the great dragon. And the great dragon is Satan, that old serpent, the devil, right? That we read about in, in Revelations. This is what I say. I'm seeing all, all of these connections that seem to roll up in, a, in Ezekiel 31. But... This also, it keeps going, right? So we, this is the same Hebrew word as Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what I say, right? So I see connection after connection here. So Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel 4 and 5, he's that great tree. He's that great tree that, that, that I see parallels to the, to the Tower of Babel. And in Jeremiah 51, we're reading that Nebuchadnezzar has swallowed up the Lord of the celestial bodies as a dragon and he's left him as an empty vessel because he's put all of his delicates, I'm being led to think Sarah's pleasure and that word pleasure is the neighbouring Hebrew word to Eden, the pleasant garden. He's filled his temple, his belly with the Lord's delicates. So now the Lord of the celestial bodies, right, is an empty vessel because all of his vessels are now in Nebuchadnezzar's belly, because he swallowed them up like a dragon. And we're reading the Pharaoh king of Egypt. He is, he is the great dragon. And in Revelation 12, we read the great dragon is the serpent, is the devil. So when we now come in and have a look at the times where we see Hebrew words translated out, as serpent, we see it happens four times. 
Now, the one that I've been dealing with is this one here, H8577. We see it as dragon, serpent, whale, and sea monster. Now, H1575, this is the one where we first see in Genesis 3.1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So we see that Hebrew word the 31 times. Serpent, snake, right? Serpent, image of serpent, fleeing serpent, mythological. Now in Revelation 12, 9, we read that the great dragon was cast out. That great dragon is that old serpent who is the devil and Satan, right? And it's, it's Greek word G3789, where we see him being referred to as that old serpent. But he's also being referred to as the great dragon, right? As the great dragon, just like Pharaoh is being referred to in Ezekiel. Now, we come into the outline of biblical usage and we get snake serpent. With the ancients, the serpent was an emblem of cunning and wisdom. The serpent, who also deceived Eve, was regarded by the Jews as the devil. So this is leading me to think, absolutely leading me to think, that this serpent that we're reading, being referred to as the great dragon, the devil, and Satan, that old serpent, is absolutely the serpent that we're reading about here in Genesis 3. And he's also being referred to as the great dragon, right, in Revelation. So we come back into the word great dragon and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, well, that's what he's being referred to as. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is being referred to as the great dragon. And the outline of biblical usage for the word serpent, G3789, who we're reading about in Revelation 12.9, that old serpent, who is the great dragon, the tools is making the connection between that great serpent and the serpent who deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. So I'm being absolutely led to think here that the serpent in the Garden of Eden is absolutely the great dragon in Revelation 12, and it's leaving me at fever pitch that that's who we're talking about in Ezekiel, where we read here about the great dragon, and that great dragon is being named as Pharaoh, right? Is being named as Pharaoh. So in both occasions where we hear Pharaoh, king of Egypt, being referred to in Ezekiel 29 and 32, he's being referred to as an aquatic creature, right? An aquatic creature who's lying in the midst of his rivers and he's also being referred to as a whale in the seas. So he's being referred to as an aquatic great dragon, the great dragon, and in Revelation 12, 9, that's the serpent that's being connected to the serpent that we're reading about here in Genesis 3, 1, right? So we have, and, and this serpent... This serpent was in the Garden of Eden because we read. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the anointed cherub that covereth was a celestial creature because he's a cherubim, right? I'm being led to think he's an angel. He's some type of angel. A cherubim is an angel. We get that in the tools. They're an angelic creature. So the anointed cherub that covereth is a celestial body. He's an angel and he was in Eden, the garden of God. And I'm absolutely pretty well settled that this serpent was also in the garden of Eden because he's tempted the woman. He's actually had a conversation with the woman and he's tempted the woman and the woman did eat. And then the serpent was cursed. And then the ground was cursed. And he had that cursed ground because the man hearkened to the voice of the wife. So the serpent I'm being led to think is in the Garden of Eden. The anointed cherub that covereth was absolutely in the Garden of Eden. 
in Revelation 12, we're reading that the serpent, the tools, is referencing it back to this serpent here. That serpent is also being referred to as the great dragon. And in Ezekiel, we're reading that Pharaoh king of Egypt, he is that great dragon as he's being referred to as an aquatic beast, right? He lays in the midst of his rivers and he, uh, he is as a whale that's in the seas, right? So we're getting, the, we're getting an aquatic beast who I'm being led to think that he's potentially been in the Garden of Eden. That's where I'm being led. And this is what I say as I go on and on and I read scripture such as this one in, a, in Ezekiel 31, I just see that this exalted cedar of Lebanon, it, it's, being, it's being related to Pharaoh, king of Egypt and all his multitude. The Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. And when you read those scriptures... It could pertain to Lucifer. It could pertain to the anointed cherub that covereth. It could pertain to Pharaoh. It could pertain to Nebuchadnezzar. It could pertain to all of them. And this 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 king of Assyria who puffed himself up. I'm about to get to in Second Kings 19. It it could be pertaining to all of them. And it's saying this is this is to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. And it only refers. It only references the Assyrian being the cedar in Lebanon. No one else, but it's talking about Pharaoh and his multitude. So I'm being led to think that this could be potentially aimed at all of them. I'm seeing that they all seem to be getting referenced here in Ezekiel 31, because you read it, you read it, because thou hast lifted up thyself in thy height, and you're going to go down to the nether parts of the earth. You're going to the pit. You're going down to hell. You're going down to hell because you were so beautiful. Your height was exalted. All the fowls of heaven made their nest. You were, you were fair in your greatness. You, all, the garden of, all the trees that were in the Garden of Eden, they envied him. But because you've lifted yourself up and your heart is lifted up in your height, well, I'm going to deliver you into the hand of the mighty one of the, of the heathen. And you're going to be driven out. You're going to be cast out just like Satan and his angels were, right? That's what I'm being led to think here. That's what I'm saying in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 31. But we come back to that word serpent that we first read in Genesis 3.1. I'm being led to think that this is the devil. This is Satan. This is that great dragon. Potentially, potentially, I'm absolutely being led to think, have been for quite some time, that this is Pharaoh. This is pertaining to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and that's why in Ezekiel we're, he we're hearing him being referred to as the great dragon. And in Revelation, the tools is telling us that the serpent is the one who deceived Eve, and he's being referred to in verse 9 of Revelation 12. That old serpent is being referred to as the great dragon, right? So it's exactly the same. It is exactly the same term. So I'm just at fever pitch that that's what we could be looking about, looking at here. That that serpent, that great dragon, is this serpent here that we're reading about in Genesis three. That dragon, Pharaoh, who lays in the midst of his rivers. He's an aquatic animal. He's been in Eden, the garden of God. And the serpent was more subtle, right? The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So the serpent was more sly. He was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now the serpent, he tempts the woman and the woman is absolutely in the garden of Eden. So for the serpent to tempt the woman... It leads me to think, pretty well settled, that the serpent as well was in the Garden of Eden. Now, the Chaldee lexicon gets very, very interesting here indeed. I'll, I'll deal with number two here first because I absolutely want to deal with number one in, a, in quite a bit of detail. Number two, we get Nahash. Now, that's a town otherwise unknown. And we get these amazing First Chronicles lineage chapters and we also get of a king 
of the of the Ammonites. Now in 1 Samuel 10, Saul is anointed king and Samuel takes a vial of oil and anoints Saul to be captain, right? Captain over the Lord's inheritance. Now, 1 Samuel 10 are some very, very profound scriptures indeed that I could very well talk about all day, but just for once, I want to try and stay on track. Just this company of prophets and prophets and priests, they appear on H4397 for angels. And we're getting a company of prophets and we're also reading a band of men. Now, Saul goes home to Gibeah and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, right? So the sons of Satan, the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought no presents, but he held his peace. So we come into 1 Samuel 11 and this is where we read about Nahash. So we're getting Nahash in the Chaldee lexicon for the serpent. And that's it here. 1 Samuel 11, 1. And Nahash, well, he came up, right? So we go straight from straight from 1 Samuel 10, where Saul's made king, and the and the and the men of Belial despise, they despise Saul, and then we just go straight into 1 Samuel 11. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, he came up, right? Is this a manifestation of a thorn and a thistle? Because the word Nahash, it's H5176 and it means serpent, right? It actually means serpent. So we're getting Nahash comes up after 1 Samuel 10 and Nahash means serpent. He comes up and we're getting Nahash in the Chaldee lexicon for the serpent, the Genesis 3-1 serpent. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. Now Jabesh Gilead are very, very fascinating indeed. They, they played a big role, a big role in the in the wash up, in the aftermath of the of the Judges 19 atrocities, the men of Jabesh Gilead, and they play a quite a profound role in, in the life and death of Saul as well. They actually go and retrieve the bones of Saul after after he dies in what I'm being led to think is a celestial fight. So it's very interesting because in 1 Samuel 10, we're getting that Saul, Saul is made, he, he's made captain over the Lord's inheritance. So he's made king of Israel, but the men of Belial, right? So the sons of Satan, the sons of the serpent, they don't like him. They despise him saying, how shall this man save us? And they despise him. And then we come into 1 Samuel 11 and we're reading that Nahash, the Ammonite and Nahash, it means serpent. He comes up, right? He comes up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And Jabesh Gilead, just, they're an amazing, it's, it's an amazing word, Jabesh Gilead, but just for now, I just want to, I just want to stay, stay on track. So this is the first incarnation that we're getting of Nahash, that we're getting in the Chaldee lexicon for serpent. We get it here in 1 Samuel 11, 1, 2 Samuel 10, 2. And this is where we say Nahash, the Ammonite came up. And Nahash, it means it means serpent. Now, the Chaldee lexicon, it's exactly the same as the serpent. Exactly the same Chaldee lexicon. We'll have a bit of a look at the at the Hebrew word. It's exactly the same as well. We've got a capital N. You get a capital N for Nahash because it's actually uh, the name of a of a man, but it's all pretty much the same right pretty much the same so this is the this is the word so this is the serpent in genesis in genesis 3 1 and this is nahash and we're getting well this is the this is the ammonite king and we're getting him in the child lexicon for the serpent and we have a look at him it also means serpent and the child lexicon 
It's exactly the same, right? It's exactly the same. So these are the incarnations that the Chowdhury lexicon gives us, and there only seems to be the three because the first one, it's pertaining to the same king. And then we come into the second one, and this is where David, he shows kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, but they reject him. They reject David's kind advances, and this is this is the son. This is the son of of the serpent of Nahash, but it's a it's a different incarnation to the one that comes up as a result of Saul becoming king and the and the sons of Belial despising him. Then we get the third incarnation in Second Samuel seventeen twenty five, and Absalom made a mace up right captain of the host. H8269, Captain of the H6635 Celestial Bodies. So I'm being led to think here that Absalom has made Amasa an archangel of his host, of his angels, of his cattle, instead of Joab. Joab was also the captain of the host. He replaced him, which Amasa was a man's son whose name was Ithra an Israelite that went into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash. There it is their sister to Zariah, Joab's mother. So we're getting Amasa here named as the son of a man and his name was Ithra and that man went into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, right? Sister to Zariah. Joab's mother. So I don't know if this is actually saying that Amasa was the was was of this of, of this serpent Nahash. It's it's difficult to tell, but I'm being led to think that it's indeed possible because it's saying that his father went into Abigail, who's the daughter of this serpent. So I'm being led to think that this what 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 this might actually be saying. And then we come into what I'm being led to think is the last incarnation of Nah. Hash in verse 27. So it's only two verses after verse 25 where we read, we seem to be reading a man of Israel going into the daughter of Nahash, who's who's pertaining to the serpent, right? But I'm being led to think here in, in verse 27 that we're talking about a different incarnation and then it rounds out. It rounds out in Chronicles 19, 1 and 2 which he's talking about, which he's talking about the same incarnation that we're reading about in 2 Samuel 10 2, where David shows kindness unto Huan, the son of Nahash. So I'm seeing, what is there? There's two, three, maybe four incarnations of, of Nahash. But this one in, in 2 Samuel 17 27, it's most interesting. It's most interesting indeed. Now, in 2 Samuel 17, we see a climax in the story of Absalom rebelling against, against David. And this is where we read in verse 27, And it came to pass when David was come to Mahanim, that Shovi, the son of Nahash, of Rabbah, of the children of Ammon, and Machiah, the son of Amiel, of Lodbar, and Barzili, the Gideon of Roglan. That's where we read about Nahash here. But this is the climax of the Absalom saga. Now, Absalom is Hebrew word H53. We see it 109 times, and it's translated out as Absalom and Abi Shalom. Now, it means my father is peace. Now, this is a most, I'm just going to touch on this for now, but this is a most interesting story indeed, where I feel we can get a lot more discernment about these scriptures and how the Holy Spirit, how the Lord God actually deals with sin, right? So Absalom, my father is peace. And we see as it pertains to Absalom here, there's two different incarnations, but he's the third son of David, killer of the firstborn Ammon, right? So Ammon's the one who defiled the daughter. But he's also leader of the revolt, right? Against his father, David. So Absalom's a rebel. Absalom's one of the rebels, right? So in 2 Samuel 14, we read in verse 25, but in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty, right? So Absalom's beautiful. 
Absalom, the son of David, is beautiful. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So when I read that, I'm instantly reminded of the anointed cherub that covereth. And I'm not saying for a minute that Absalom is the anointed cherub that covereth. But what I'm saying is that it reminds me. This, this description of Absalom, it reminds me of the anointed cherub that covereth in Ezekiel 28 because he was created perfect, he was created beautiful, and here we're reading that Absalom is much praised for his beauty. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So what does this mean? To have no blemish. What does this mean? exactly is it a physical appearance or is it a spiritual blemish how is how is absalom how does this actually manifest that absalom has no blemish so i'm being led to think that absalom is in perfect beauty just like the anointed chair of the covereth and the anointed chair of the covereth he was perfect in beauty and full of wisdom are those two things connected but we're reading here that Absalom, he was, he was praised for his beauty and there was no blemish in him. Now, in, in chapter 15, we, this is where it all starts to climb um, climax with the, with the Absalom story. And it came to pass after this that Absalom pre prepared him chariots and horses, right? So celestial bodies and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early right he rose up early and stood b b beside the way of the gate i see this word gate and it leads me to think we're talking about celestial gates and this is what i say i'm seeing chariots and horses celestial bodies rising up early and stood beside the way of the celestial gates right that's how these scriptures present to me and it was so that when any man that had a controversy right check this out when, when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. So we've got Absalom, who's in perfect beauty. He's, he's, he's interjecting himself into the matters for the king David. And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. So Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, right? So Absalom is in perfect beauty, and there was no blemish in him, and he desires to be the judge that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do obeisance, same word that Joseph used, in his dream, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment so that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel, right? So we've got Absalom, who is, and we know, and we know from the tools and from the scriptures that Absalom he rebelled against David. He is he, he there's no he's in perfect beauty. He's in perfect beauty, and there's no blemish in Absalom. And here. I'm being led to think that he is exalting himself and he's putting himself in the place of the king. And that's how this story, that's how this story goes, is that he, the, David flees, David flees because Absalom steals, he steals the hearts of the men of Israel and he made himself king. So he is, he is exalting himself and he's in perfect beauty and there's no blemish in him. So I just see absolute connections here and similarities to the anointed cherub that covereth. We've got Absalom right in perfect beauty. He is no blemish and he's exalting himself over the king of Israel, King David, right? Now the scriptures are leading me to think that Absalom 
perfect in beauty, with no blemish, was a thorn and a thistle that came up due to the sin of David that we read about here in 2 Samuel 11, where David went into Bathsheba, who is the mother of Solomon, but she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, right? So I'm being led to think that the story of Absalom is David's punishment for the sin of what he did here. And in 1 Kings 15, we read that the Lord, he imputes no sin to David whatsoever apart from this sin here. And I'm being led to think that Absalom came up as a thorn and a thistle due to this sin. Before I get to the story, as it pertains to Absalom, I just want to put down something that I've been wanting to put down for a while that while I'm here, I'll just put it down quickly now. So Uriah the Hittite. So I find this fascinating to start with because Uriah, check this out, right? So Uriah is Hebrew word H-223. We see it the 39 times. It's translated out as Uriah and Uijah. But it means... Jehovah is my light, is my flame, right? But we come down into the Chaldee lexicon and we get flame of Jehovah. Now, Uriah is a Hittite. He's not a part of Israel. And I, I start to find this more and more fascinating as we read the, as we read about Nahesh. They seem to side with David. The, these men of Nahesh, they seem to side with David. And we've got Uriah. He's a Hittite, right? So he's not a part of Israel. But we read in 1 Chronicles 41 here that Uriah the Hittite, he's actually one of the valiant men of David's army. So Uriah's a Hittite. He's not a part of Israel. The Hittites are Canaanites. And Uriah, the Chaldee lexicon, is giving us flame of Jehovah and the outline of biblical usage gives us his name means Jehovah is my light. Jehovah is, is my flame and flame of Jehovah, right? Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. But in 2 Samuel 11, we read about David. He steals. He steals Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon. Now, David sends to Joab, right? David sends to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. Okay, so this is this is all talking about Joab. Now, Joab, we read quite a few times in the scriptures that Joab is the H8269 captain of the H6635 host. We see it three to four times in the scriptures directly, but we also see it indirectly in, in other scriptures. But Joab is the, he is the captain of the host. Now he killed both Abner and Amasa in cold blood. I'm being led to think that Joab is a murderer. But this story in Samuel, as confronting as it is, 2 Samuel 11, Leads me to think that David was a murderer as well, because that's what he does to Uriah the Hittite, right? So, Joab is the captain of the celestial bodies. And the word captain is Hebrew word H8269. Now, this is the word that I've been dealing with on my videos quite a lot of recent, where I'm being led to think that they are archangels. The H8269 captains, princes, are the archangels of the H6635 celestial bodies, right? So this is what Joab is. Joab is a captain. He's a captain. I'm being led to think an archangel, right? So this is the... This is the same Hebrew word that I've been talking about recently when David assembles all of the, I'm being led to think, archangels of Israel in First Chronicles 28, where we read about the house and the footstool and the ark of God, all these scriptures I've been dealing, dealing with recently on my videos, right? So David assembles all the princes, all the captains of the companies 
I'm being led to think archangels of Nazareth of, of the celestial bodies. This is what Joab is. Joab is a captain of the celestial bodies. And this is the word, H8269. This is the word that we read about in Judges, where we read Caesarea was the captain of the host of the Canaanites and the stars fought in their courses against Caesarea. And in Daniel, we read that Michael, who we all know, Michael is an archangel, he's being referred to as an H8269 prince. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of the people. And we also read it in Daniel 10, 21, but Michael, your prince. And Michael means who is like God, which is not a question, it's a statement. Michael means who is like God in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, Michael is being referred to as an archangel and he is an H8269 prince. So I'm being led to think that he is a captain, a prince of the celestial bodies. And that's what we read about in Revelation where he goes to war against Satan and his angels. So I'm being led to think that that's what Satan is as well. Satan potentially is an H8269 prince. He is an H8269 captain of these here, of the celestial bodies, they being angels, right? They being angels and, and stars. And as I go on and on, it's looking a lot more and more like to me now that angels are in fact stars. So this is Joab, right? He's, he's a prince, just like Michael. He's a prince. Joab, he is a captain, a prince of the celestial bodies. And we actually get it worded differently in First Chronicles 27, where he's nominated as a general, right? A general of the king's army. So he's a captain. He's a captain of, a captain of the celestial bodies. So the word captain is prince, ruler, chief, leader, chieftain, official, captain. And we actually get a patron angel. And this is what Michael the archangel is. He's an H8269 prince. He's a captain of the host. Caesarea. I'm being led to think Caesarea is an incarnation, potentially of Michael and his angels, Michael the archangel, but the archangels of Maseroth going forth to war against Satan and his angels. And Caesarea, because he, was, he went to war against Israel and he was the captain, the prince of the celestial bodies, of Canaan. We're getting celestial bodies against Maseroth and Satan and his Satan and his angels. So this is this is Joab, right? Joab is a captain of the celestial bodies. So then we come into 2 Samuel 11 and it gets very, very interesting indeed because David writes a letter to Joab, right? So Joab is the captain of the celestial bodies. And in Psalm 147, we read that the Lord, he knows all the stars by their name, right? Stars are living celestial bodies. I'm being led to think they are, in fact, angels and archangels. That's what, we, that's what we're looking at when we look up into the sky at night time. We're actually looking at celestial bodies that have life angels and that's who Joab is the prince the captain over the the, the the celestial bodies the angels of Israel right so how does that play out how does that play out in the scriptures and do we actually see these stars getting named because the Lord knows all the stars by their names right being absolutely let's think we're reading it here that Joab is one because Joab's an archangel right so he's in charge of of all of the celestial bodies, of his division. Of his division, he's in charge of celestial bodies. He's an archangel over angels, over celestial bodies, right? So this is where it gets very interesting and a little bit confronting about this story because, and this is how the scriptures are leading me to think, and they have been for quite some time, because we know that Uriah, he, he is the wife of Bathsheba, and Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon, and this is the one sin that's imputed to David. So in, in verse 15 we read, 
And he wrote, wrote in the letter saying, send ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, right? Of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And we read that Uriah the Hittite, he died also when he goes to when he goes to the, the forefront of the hottest battle. So he's gone to he's gone to the war front, right? And he's been ordered by Joab, who's been ordered by David, and Joab is the captain of the host. He's the prince, the H A two six nine prince. I'm being led to think the archangels of the celestial bodies. So when I read this in Samuel, I'm being led to think that this is what Uriah is. Uriah, he is one of these celestial bodies. And we actually read Uriah, flame of Jehovah, right? And we his name actually means Jehovah is my light flame. And in 1 Chronicles 11, we read in verse 41 that Uriah the Hittite, he is named among the valiant men of the armies, right? Now, this is a different Hebrew word that I'm going to get to in just a sec. But the he's nominated as one of the valiant men. And this word valiant men is Hebrew word H1368 that we first see that describes the giants. Now, I'm not being led to think that each time we read H1368 that we're talking about giants, but this word H1368, it's pertaining to mighty men of strength. And we actually see in the Chaldee lexicon, it pertains to a soldier. So the host go forth to war, right? The host go forth to war. And we see it, we see it a lot in the scriptures. It's 158 times and we see it translated out at pertaining to strength, mighty men of war. H1368. That's what Uriah the Hittite, he's been nominated as the valiant men, the mighty men of, of the armies. But when we search for the words H1368 and H6635, celestial bodies, and the mighty men, H1368, of which Uriah the Hittite is actually one, when we put them together with the word Joab, we get two matches. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the hosts, the H6635 celestial bodies of the mighty men. Right, so Joab is the H8269 captain, prince. I'm being led to think archangel of all the celestial bodies. And here we're reading that Joab has been sent by David and all the celestial bodies of the mighty men, the valiant men, of whom Uriah, the Hittite, is being named as one in First Chronicles 11. That's it here, the valiant men, the H1368, valiant men of the armies. So this for me is absolutely connecting H1368 to being of the celestial bodies and all the host of the mighty men, H1368, and they're the strong men. They're the men of strength in the celestial armies, the men of strength, and that's who Uriah the Hittite is being referred to as here. He's being named as a valiant man of the armies, a man of strength of the H6635 celestial armies, the celestial bodies of which Joab is a captain of, a prince of, I'm being led to think, an archangel of. Now, this word armies is a different Hebrew word to H6635. It's Hebrew word H2428, which is the word that I've been talking about recently on my videos. This is the men of activity, right? So Nebuchadnezzar's army, that's and Nebuchadnezzar, his army was made up by H8269 princes. We read that in Jeremiah 39. So Nebuchadnezzar has an H2428 army, and that's what Uriah the Hittite is being nominated as. So Uriah the Hittite, he's been nominated 
as being a valiant man, a strong man, a mighty man of the H2428 army. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar's army is made up of, of whom dwell these H8269 princes. And again, Nebuchadnezzar, his name means may Nebo, protect the crown. Nebo, of course, means prophet, and it's pertaining to Latin Mercury and Egyptian Thoth, the god, the celestial body. And it's in the Chaldee lexicon, we actually get the planet Mercury as the worship of Mercury. Mercury being the messenger of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar means may Nebo protect the crown. Nebo is Mercury, the god, the, the messenger of the gods. And amid Nebuchadnezzar's H8269 princes, we've got Nargal Sharazar, which means prince of fire. He's a chief soothsayer and a ruler in the army of Nebuchadnezzar. He is an H8269 prince. And in the Chaldee lexicon, we get the Prince of Mars, right? The H8269 Prince of Mars, a archangel of Mars, the prince whom Mars favours. And then we also get Sangra Nebo, who's the sword of Nebo, the sword of Mercury, one of the princes. And we get this word generals again that we got for Joab. One of the princes, H8269, princes, generals, archangels of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And in the Chaldee lexicon, we get the sword of Nebo, of Mercury, i.e. the sword of Mercury, right? And these H8269 princes, captains, archangels make up Nebuchadnezzar's H2428 armies. And that's what Uriah the Hittite is. Uriah the Hittite, he is of the valiant men of these celestial armies. So he's one of the strong men. He's one of the mighty men of the host of Joab. So Joab is the H8269 Captain Prince Archangel of the celestial bodies of the H6635 host. And within that host, we've got the H1368 mighty men. And that's what Uriah the Hittite is. Uriah the Hittite is a H1368 valiant man. He's a mighty man. He's a strong man of the host of Joab. And Joab, he is the archangel, the captain, the prince of that celestial host. So this is what I say. That when I read these scriptures, I'm being absolutely led to think that we're getting a manifestation here of the Lord knowing all the stars by their name. Then and Uriah, Uriah, I'm being led to think he's one, he's one of the celestial bodies that Joab, who is the H8269 captain over the host of Israel. That's Joab, and one of his hosts is Uzariah the Hittite, right? So in 1 Kings 15, we read that this is the only sin. This is the only sin that the Lord imputes to David, and it's quite the sin. I'm being led to think that that's what this says in 2 Samuel 11, that David is actually a murderer. We know that we know that Joab is because Joab he kills he he kills Abner and Amasa two other captains of the host in cold blood and it was to the chagrin of David we read that in First Kings two I'll get to this in just a sec David didn't like it he he seems to condemn Joab for these actions. Joab's a very, very complex figure in those scriptures. And as I go on and on, so, so is David, because that for me is what this is saying, that David, because if you're a, if you're a king, it's very cold. It's very cold here on the New South Wales Central Coast this morning. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the 19th of May. 19th of May at about half past seven in the morning here and it's very cold. My little thermometer up there says it's six degrees so it's 
I think winter has winter's arrived. It's, it's very, very cold here. But if you're the king and you order one of your subjects to kill another one of your subjects, that makes you a murderer. And it's a gross abuse of your power. It's a gross abuse of your power. It's just because you don't actually do it. To me, I, th I think, I, I, I look at this just my view. I look at, at 2 Samuel 11, even though Joab actually, he, he's, he's the one that seems to have committed it. No, nobody actually did it. Nobody actually did this because they led him to go into the, the hottest battle so that, so that he died. So they both led him to his own demise, to his own death. And for me here, this is a gross, this is a gross, gross misuse, abuse of David's power. And Joab, this is the third time. This is the third time that I see Joab just murder people in the, in the scriptures. So there's more to consider here, right? Because David's held up in very, very high regard in those scriptures, but I can't see this any other way that David has ordered a good man, a just man who doesn't seem to have sinned at all, who was a mighty man. He was one of these mighty men of, of, of Joab's army, of, of Joab's host, and they killed him because David wanted his David wanted his wife, right? And we we read at the end of the chapter, we read at the end of the chapter that the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, right? And I'll get to that in just a sec. So in, in 1 Kings 2, we read this talk that David gives to Solomon and he gives instructions about various people about his journey and he speaks just about what he wants Solomon to do to them after he dies and after Solomon sits on his throne. In verse 5, we read about Joab. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel. Right? So this is Abner and Amasa. Unto Abner and Amasa, who he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his whorehead go down to the grave in peace. So this whorehead, is, it pertains to his grey hair. So when, when he's old, I'm being led to think. So David here is commanding Solomon to not let Joab to go to the grave in peace due to him murdering Abner and Amasa, the other two captains of the host. But he doesn't mention what he ordered Joab to do in 2 Samuel 11, right? And this is the only sin. This is the only sin that the Lord imputes to David. We read that in 1 Kings 15. So Joab's a murderer. I, I see Joab has murdered at least three people and two of them are Abner and Amasa, two other captains, princes, archangels of the celestial bodies. And the third was Uriah. So Uriah and David, I'm being led to think they both murdered Uriah the Hittite, right? In cold blood, because David, he wanted his wife, right? So it's most, most unjust. But yet, but yet, he condemns Joab here. David condemns Joab for murdering these two seemingly just men, Abner and Amasa, two other captains of the of the celestial bodies. But he doesn't mention this. He doesn't mention this. So there's more to consider here, right? There's so much more to consider because David is condemning Joab for doing what he commanded him to do. These are these are some scriptures that have always, always caught my attention, right? So this story goes on where Bathsheba bears David a son and we read that the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, right? Now, this son, this son actually ends up dying 
as as the Lord as the Lord commanded, as the Lord promised. But then David comforts Bathsheba, who later becomes his wife, right? And the thing that David did displeased the Lord, and the, the the child dies, and then David comforts Bathsheba, his wife, in her grief due to this son being dead as the commandment of the Lord, and she bare a son and called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him, right? So there's just so, so much more. There's so much more to consider with all this. But at the start of 2 Samuel 12, the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he tells him this riddle, and as he declares the riddle, Nathan says to David, Thou art the man, right? Thou art the man. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart, right? This is fascinating as I go on and on. The sword shall never depart from thine house, right? The house of David. We're reading about the house of David and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to rule in the tabernacle of David and sit upon the throne of David. And right through these scriptures, we see David talking like he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I see it over and over again in these scriptures where David's name is where the Lord Jesus Christ's name would be in the New Testament. And here we're reading that the sword in the house of David will never depart due to what he did to Uriah the Hittite and stole, and stole, right? And stole Uriah's, Uriah the Hittite's wife Bathsheba, who is the mother of Solomon and the Lord, the Lord loved Solomon and we know we know we all know the story about Solomon but this sword it's never ever going to depart from his house right from his house it's coming in so so hard right now as to what a house might actually be because thou hast despised me and had taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife thus saith the Lord right so this is the point of this part of this video right so this is how i'm seeing how the lord deals with sin because this this is a this is a promise of what absalom actually went and did thus saith the lord because he came he came up out of his own house and the sword shall never depart from thine house by the sword the sword in the house of David, and that says never. That right there says never. So the, the sword shall never depart out of thine house. And I'm being led to think the house of David is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? More to consider. There's always more to consider. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thy eyes and give them unto thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son now this word neighbor becomes quite interesting indeed because i'm being led to think that this neighbor is actually absalom so let's go back to hebrew word h5175 and this is the serpent serpent snake image of serpent fleeing serpent mythological and we see the child lexicon it gives us Nahash and it gives us of a king of the Ammonites. And this is Hebrew word H5175. We see that's exactly the same as H5176. And it's pertaining to Nahash, the Ammonite, right? I'm starting to see this connection between Nahash. And Nahash means serpent and the Ammonites. So in 1 Samuel 11, we're reading that Nahash, the Ammonite, came up. And in 2 Samuel 10, 
we're reading that David, he will show kindness unto Hanun, the son of Nahash. And I'm being led to think that he potentially is actually the son of this Nahash here. The scriptures don't seem clear on that, but potentially he's the son of this of this Nahash here. That's the son. And David wants to show kindness. So David sent to comfort him by the hands of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. So I'm being led to think we've got two we've got two kings of Ammon here. They're both named Nahash, and Nahash means serpent, and it's the neighbouring Hebrew word to the serpent that was in that was in the Garden of Eden. It, it, it's, it's exactly the same, except we're getting a capital letter here, and we see that the Chaldee lexicon is also the same for both. So this is Nahash, and we're seeing two incarnations of him as an Ammonite king, but it seems to just continue to connect. And we see these two incarnations that I've been talking about with the climax of the Absalom story. Now, I'm not seeing a connection to Ammon here, but there's absolutely one in this fourth incarnation of Nahash in, in verse 27 of 2 Samuel 17. And it came to pass when David was come to Mahanim, two, two camps, that Shobi, the son of Nahash, of Rabah, of the children of Ammon, right? So we've got three different, three different connections to Nahash and Ammon. So this has caught my attention in 2 Samuel 12. Nathan gives the riddle to David and declares that he is the man. And he says, Wherefore thou despise the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hath taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon, right? With the children of Ammon. So there's a there's another connection here. So we come into 2 Samuel 11. So this is the chapter before, 2 Samuel 12. And that's how it starts. And it came to pass after the year it expired, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And then we read the story about David commanding Joab to murder Uriah the Hittite so he can have his wife. And the chapter before that, 2 Samuel 10, we read that David, he wants to show kindness to Hanun the son of Nahash, right? So this is the serpent. This is the serpent, and this is the son of the other king, I'm being led to think, who also is Nahash, who is the serpent. So David wants to show kindness to them, but they reject him. The princes, the H8269 princes of the children of Ammon, I'm being led to think his archangels, they reject they reject David's kindness and they go to war. They go to war against David and Israel. And in verse 6 we read, And when the children of Ammon saw that they stunk before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Bethirob and the Syrians of Zobah. But the Lord smites them. The Lord smites them and they're, and they're destroyed. So this Hazidra... He's the king of Syria. So Ammon, they've sought out the help of, of Syria and the Lord smites them. The Lord smites them. And I'm being led to think in another celestial war here, the war front, Uriah the Hittite being one of the, of the warriors of the army of Joab. And in verse 19 we read, And when all the kings that were servants to Hadriza saw that they were smitten before Israel, 
they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. So Ammon's been destroyed, the Syrians have been destroyed, and now the Syrians, they're afraid to help Ammon to destroy Israel. And we come into 2 Samuel 11, and we read that Israel have destroyed the children of Ammon and we read about the story of David stealing and murdering, stealing the wife of, of Uriah and murdering Uriah. And in 2 Samuel 12, Nathan's telling David the words of the Lord and he's saying that David has slain Uriah with the, with the sword of the children of Ammon. So there's a connection here, right? Because I see in, in 2 Samuel 11, I'm not seeing who this war was actually against. It doesn't seem to be clear. It just says that we go to the forefront of the hottest battle. It doesn't seem to state who the war is against. But I'm not being led to think that it was against Ammon because they just destroyed them. But in 2 Samuel 12, that's how the Lord is telling David, that's how he killed Uriah the Hittite. He killed him with the sword of the children of Ammon. And David did that. David did that by sending Uriah the Hittite to the sorest battle, right? To the sorest battle. So I'm seeing this connection. I'm starting to see this connection now with the children of Ammon and with Nahesh the serpent, right? With Nahesh the serpent. But in any case, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. I'm being led to think that this is this is Absalom. The whole saga, the whole story of Absalom. Remember, Absalom was beautiful. Absalom was beautiful, he didn't have a blemish, and he stole the hearts of Israel as he exalted himself in place of his father David, and he became the judge, and David flees. David flees because of what Absalom, his son, had done. So he's exalting himself on the throne of David, right? On the throne of David, and this is what I'm being led to think. It, it is the reason why for this occurring because of what because of what David did to Uriah the Hittite how, how, how he murdered Uriah the Hittite and stole his wife and she bare child that child dies and then David comforts her goes into her and she is with child again he took her to wife and she bare Solomon and the Lord loves Solomon, right? The Lord loves Solomon. So it's all... Wow, we, right? Wow, we. Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, the house of David, and the sword is never going to depart from the house of David. So we've got the... I'm being led to think this potentially is the sword of the house of David. It's a biblical concept this that I feel as though potentially the Holy Spirit is is showing to me here the sword of the house of David and it's never going to depart never ever that's what this says it will never depart from thine house so we've got the sword of the house of David and the Lord saying I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house and I will take thy wives before thy eyes and will give them unto thy neighbour and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. Now I'm being led to think we get a manifestation of this in 2 Samuel 16 and in verse 20. Then said Absalom to Hithothel, give counsel among you what we shall do. So this Hithothel is a is quite the character in those scriptures. I'm being led to think he's a very, very wise man, but he 
he rebelled against David in this story of Absalom. His Hebrew word, H302, and we see it the 20 times, and each time it's translated out as Hithothel. But check this out. His name means, my brother is foolish, and it pertains to folly, right? It pertains to folly. Now, he's the counsellor of David and the grandfather of Bathsheba. So this, for me, adds extra interest to this whole story because he's the grandfather of Bathsheba. And Bathsheba, of course, is the mother of Solomon, where all this seems to be centering around because David sent Joab, the captain of the celestial bodies, to kill one of his better warriors, Uriah the Hittite, in the battle so David could steal his wife, Bathsheba, and this Hithothel, he is David's counsellor and he's the grandfather of Bathsheba. Now, we actually see this in the scriptures when we look at this Hebrew word, Eliam, H403, of which we only see the two times and each time it's translated out as Eliam. Eliam, God of the people, L, right, L. God of the people or God is kinsman. Now that's just fascinating when we, when I, so I've got the adoption coming in hard right now as it pertains to the resurrection. God is kinsman. Bathsheba's father, a Gileadite warrior of, of David. So we see it, we see it twice in the scriptures. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam? Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam. And then in 2 Samuel 23, 34, we read Eliph Eliphalet, the son of Abishai, the son of Machuthite, and Eliam, who's the son of Hithothel. So Hithothel is the father of Eliam, and Eliam is the father of Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam, right? So when we read this in the in the outline of biblical usage, it's absolutely what the scriptures are saying. So this Hithothel, he's the grandfather of Bathsheba, and this is what this is all centering around, but he is the counsellor of David, and he rebelled. He rebelled against David, in this in this saga right so it just adds for me it just adds extra spice but in any case we come back into second samuel 16 here then said absalom to hithothel because he's rebelled he's rebelled against david and he's now siding with absalom give counsel among you it's just so exciting my voice is cracking because i'm just so excited with these scriptures right now i get more and more excited Every day, every day I'm in those scriptures, I just get more excited. And Hithothel said unto Absalom, Go into thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art aboard of thy father. Then shall the hands of all them that are with thee be strong. Now, in verse 23 we read here, that the counsel of Hithothel, which he counseled in those days, was if a man had inquired at the oracle of God, right? So was all the counsel of Hithothel, both with David and with Absalom. So he's a man of amazing wisdom because his counsel was as the oracle of God, right? And he was the counsellor of David and he rebelled and he went with Absalom. And we actually read in these scriptures that I'm getting to that brought me here in 2 Samuel 17 where we read about Nahash just a couple of verses before we read that in the end Hithothel saw that his counsel was not followed. He saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, he put his household in order, houses right, and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulchre of his father. So Hithothel's demise was by his own hands when he hangs himself 
because he saw that his counsel was not followed because the counsel of Hithothel, it was it was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So he's a very wise man. He's very highly regarded. He's very, very blessed indeed of the Lord. And when he saw that his counsel was not followed, he went and hung himself. That That is the demise of Hithothel. But here Absalom absolutely listens to Hithothel, right? So Hithothel's counsel is to, to Absalom is to go into his father's concubines, which he hath left, to keep the house and all Israel, right? So all Israel, so this becomes pivotal. All Israel shall hear that thou art aboard of thy father, then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong, right? So check this out. So so they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all, right? In the sight of all Israel. So we come back into 2 Samuel 12, and this is what the Lord is telling David. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes. Right? Wives. I'm being led to think we've got concubines and wives. Right? There's a couple of differences in the story. Like neighbor. I'm being led to think neighbor is Absalom. And the, and the concubines here are the wives that we're, that we're talking about here. Thus saith the Lord, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, Absalom, and I will take thy wives, the, the, the concubines, before thine eyes, and I will give them unto thy neighbour, Absalom, and he shall lie with all thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst secretly... But I will do this thing before is all Israel and before the sun, right? So when you do something in front of the of the sun, everything can see it, right? Because the sun can see everything. While it's daytime, the sun sees everything. So if you're doing something inside of all the sun, that means everybody can see it. And that's what we're reading here. In, he, he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son, for thou did it secretly. So he did it in secret, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. So we compare the two scriptures, and this is what I say. I'm being led to think that, that we're getting a manifestation here of just how the Lord deals with sin and how he's dealt with sin in this instance because he's raised up from David's own house Absalom so he can defile David's wives because David killed the wife of a just man and that's what these two scriptures are absolutely saying here so straight away I see a parallel to Isaiah 40 22 it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof as, are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, right? And spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So in Isaiah 40 here, we're reading that the heavens are being described as a curtain. And yes, I do think of the tabernacle of the congregation, which is never, ever far from my thoughts. So he stretches out the heavens as a curtain and he stretches out those curtains for a tent for them to dwell in. And this is what we're reading in 2 Samuel 16 when Absalom spread a tent, right? He spread a tent upon the top of the house. So when I read these scriptures, I'm not, I'm not being led to think that Absalom's just over here and he's He's on the roof of some person's house, literally. No, I'm being led to think it's it's something far, far more profound than that. For instance, when we read about the the death of, of Absalom, we read that Absalom rode, rode upon a mule. And when the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak and his head caught hold of the oak and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went 
went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in a night. So that's how people hang people on the earth is that they kick, they, they put a rope around their neck and they kick out whatever's be, be beneath them and they, and they choke on that rope. And that's what we're reading here, that Absalom rolled upon a mule and the mule went under the thick boughs of the great oak and his head caught hold of the oak, the noose, and he was taken up, right? He was taken up between the heaven and the earth but the mule went away. So they kicked the mule out from under him. And that's what verse 10 is telling us, that he was hanged in an oak. He was hanged in an oak, but he went He went between the heaven and the earth. So it's not just a little tree over there where he, where he was hung. It's something far, far deeper. And that's what I see in those scriptures constantly, that it's deeper. It's forever, ever deeper and I'm being led to think we could actually get a manifestation, well, we could be getting a manifestation here in 2 Samuel 16, where they're spreading a tent. They're spreading a tent. They're spreading forth a curtain. And that tent is where they actually dwell on the top of the house. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel, in the sight of the son. So I'm being led to think. So this is what I this is why I want to tell this story. I'm being absolutely led to think that the reason for the whole saga of Absalom was so the Lord dealt. That's how the Lord dealt with the sin of David when he went into Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, and he killed him. He killed him unjustly. And this is the one sin that the Lord imputes to David. No other sin is imputed to David than this one. So it's a it's a big one. I'm being led to think it makes David a murderer, but it seems that the Lord God still loved David despite this, and he only imputes this one sin to him. And David, Joab, right? So so Joab just gets more and more complicated as I go on. Because in this, it, check this out, right? So you talk about profound. So we come back into 2 Samuel 17 and we read, we read these most profound scriptures where they go over a brook of water and they're going up and down in, in wells and we're talking about passing over Jordan, right? But I just want to try and stay on track just for once, just for once. In verse 23, we read, because Hithothel, he was a very wise man, the grandfather of Bathsheba, who this seems to be all revolving around, he saw his counsel was not followed, so he hangs himself. Then David came to Mahanim. Now Mahanim means two camps, and Jacob named this place Mahanim because he saw the angels of God and he called them God's host. This is Mahanim. Two camps. And Absalom passed over Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom made a Mesa captain of the host. H8269, captain, prince, I'm being led to think, archangel of the celestial bodies. Rulers over his cattle. Instead of Joab. And Joab, of course, winds up murdering a Mesa along with Abner. Instead of Joab, which a Mesa was a man's son whose name was Ithra the Israelite that went into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash. Right? So there it is there, the serpent, sister to Zariah, Joab's mother. So Israel and Absalom pitched in the land of Gilead. And it came to pass when David was come to Mahanim that Shobi the son of Nahash. So... Is Shobi, who we know is the son of Nahash, is Shobi the brother of Hanun, who is also the son of Nahash? Are they brothers? And in, in 2 Samuel 17, 25, we're reading about Abigail, who's the daughter of Nahash. So is Abigail the sister of Shobi and Hanun, or are we seeing different manifestations of 
Nahash. So be the son of Nahash, the serpent, of Rabah, of the children of Ammon. So we've got Ammonites, right? We've got Ammonites here who will keep going. And Machar, the son of... And Barzili, the Gideite of Rogogon. And brought beds, right? And basins and earthen vessels, right? So check this out. Check this out. In the New Testament, Paul calls earthen vessels people's bodies. When you read that, I ask thee, are you being led to think, apart from being the truth being quite confronting, which which it can be, and I find it, it can be in instances like this, if this isn't somebody's body, what is it? And why are we reading earthen vessels in the New Testament being referred to as bodies? When we read something in the Old Testament and then Paul says what it is in the New Testament, is that how we read scripture that Paul's just telling us? Is Paul just telling us straightly in the New Testament that we're talking about bodies, that we're talking about vessels of clay, right? Yes, it seems strange, but that's what this says. Earth and vessels, right? Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words remain forever. But no one knows the date now when the end will be, not even the angels. No, nor even God's Son. Only the Father knows. The world will be at ease, banquets and parties and weddings, just as it was in Noah's time before the sudden coming of the flood. People wouldn't believe what was going to happen until the flood actually arrived and took them all away. So shall my coming be. Two men will be working together in the fields, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be going about their household tasks, one will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. You've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there. You've been left behind